All of us have experienced a flu or a fever. It's part of our down moments when we feel that our body has a mind of its own and is punishing us for something we did or didn't do. One particular aspect of fevers is the foggy state of mind we enter into, when we really aren't at full consciousness. We hear, see, smell, taste, and touch, but none actually process in real time. And by the time we actually do feel something, what had triggered our senses was gone. I remember once being in such a state, struggling with undulating temperatures. But what I remember most was when my grandmother came to check on me. I don't remember her as I would remember shooting this video, but I remember her as if she was a spirit that had descended from the heavens. With the chandelier of the room beaming its light and casting her onto my eyes in silhouette. I could only process her lips moving ever so slightly. Was she speaking to me? I by then had also felt her hand on my forehead, her rough, hard-working hand that felt ever so gentle, soothing and pleasant. And within a minute or two, her lips stopped moving, and I felt the exposed cooler air on my forehead as she pulled her hand away. By the time I realized this, she had left the room. The next day, my fever was gone. As a child, my impression was that my grandmother had apparently cured me with her recital of several adiyas, supplications, that were typical for the healing of the sick. Keeping our body young and healthy is a timeless obsession. Civilization after another have attempted to cheat our body's fragility and temperance. With the imbalances, injuries and diseases that can render our physique weak, alternative beliefs and medicines of antiquity played a vital role in not only curing such maladies, but also helped in elevating the mental and emotional fortitude of those suffering, as well as providing comfort to the involved communities. It wasn't any different in pre- or post-Islam Arabia. Folk and traditional medicine and therapies were an important element of daily life. With Islam also came the Quran and its medicinal guidelines, followed by what was referred to as prophetic medicine, that was based on the therapeutic actions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. All in all, and as a crossroads to the civilized world, Arabia had significant local as well as assimilated wisdoms from neighboring regions pertaining to physiological beliefs and long-tried medicines. We'll be reviewing the various components that make up what is considered as traditional Arabic and Islamic medicine. There are two main eras of traditional Arabic and Islamic medicine. The pre-Islam era, with its various practices and conventions, and the Islamic era which continued on with the same pre-Islam traditions but added on other components to the mix. In this video, we'll not be looking into the substantial advancements in the sciences of medicine by leading Muslim polymaths of the Middle Ages, so no Ibn Sinas or Razis will be explored. But we'll focus more on how well-being and healing practices, based initially on tradition and folklore and later in time on religious wisdoms, came into the daily lives of the people in the region. In the pre-Islam era, the many Arab civilizations had indeed established their own traditional complementary medicinal findings over the ages, but these same civilizations were also heavily influenced by those around them. The Yunani medicine, Greek medicine of antiquity, Farsi medicine, as well as the Ayurvedic systems of the Indian subcontinent. And so to list these as Arab or Islamic is not meant to claim that these elements were innovations of the region but were an integral part of a larger wellness system that had developed over time. Such a diverse system was composed of five main principles, medicinal herbs, applied therapies, dietary therapy, mind-body therapy, and spiritual healing. The following listing of the various practices are but a small selection of the vast array of ancient treatments within the large codex of traditional Arab and Islamic medicine. Medicinal herbs have throughout history been a vital element of the treatment of humanity from illness and disease. In the Arab Islamic world, herbs, be them taken directly or through concoctions based on long-standing recipes, were used to help the sick in overcoming their health struggles. These remedies came in the form of the ethyl tamarisk or tamarix aphila, a locally sourced tree with its leaves, bark, and sap that were used in a variety of manners for wound healing activity as well as treatment of infections and inflammation. Or with the black seeds from the Nigella sativa tree, and as recorded by the words of the Prophet, a remedy for every illness except death, were seeds that helped greatly in curing fever, skin diseases, fungus, parasites, as well as heel bites and stings from poisonous animals. 
Camphor, a waxy white solid extracted from the Cinnamonum camphora tree, was another medicinal cure that was an essential oil. It was used as a decongestant that could assist with headaches and could also operate as an anti-inflammatory. Insomnia could also be treated through the use of camphor. Acacia gum, a hardened sap from the acacia tree, had many medicinal applications, such as for gingivitis or skin irritations, as well as for gastrointestinal imbalances, where it showed great potential as a prebiotic, probiotic, and symbiotic, meaning the digestive system would overall become very healthy upon its consumption. Applied therapies are the physical therapies that were treatments that came in many forms and included the practice of hijama, known as cupping. The slight variation that was more common in the Middle East was the use of cupping in association with bloodletting. The term hijama alluded to the concept of returning the body to a balanced and harmonious state. Keli or cautery was another form of invasive therapy that addressed the healing of liver and tumor-related diseases as well as used for the treatment of psychiatric and non-psychiatric mental problems in patients. Back in the day, one of the most common methods to stop bleeding of small to medium-sized wounds was the use of charred fiber. Its coagulation qualities were very strong, and the material used most often was cotton. Miswak, or a teeth-cleaning twig from the Salvadora Persica tree, has been a dominant method for dental hygiene. The twig is carefully carved to create a brush-like end a precursor to the modern toothbrush. One main benefit of the miswak is the natural antibacterial excretion of the twig that provides great protection for the teeth. The idea of food as medicine is not a new idea. Many civilizations preceding those of the Arab and Islamic civilizations held food in that regard, that what you put in could be both a healer and a poison. And on that same front, the tradition of Islam carried on with the principle that certain foods had great medicinal value and could both prevent and cure a weakened health. Dates and honey are at the forefront of this principle. Dates were renowned for their antioxidant, anti-diabetic, anti-cholesteremic, and anti-inflammatory qualities. Dates were a mainstay for recovery of the body, be it from sickness or from injury. Even women who had just given birth would be provided a diet abundant with dates. With honey and its repeated mention in the Qur'an as a curing food, it would also be held very highly by the Prophet, functioning as a general antibiotic, as well as reported to assist with a diverse range of gastrointestinal issues such as diarrhea. Not only was honey a solution for tougher maladies, but was also a fundamental medicine for the treatment of the common cold and cough, as well as the healing of small wounds. Figs, another fruit, was also held high as a therapeutic cure for cases such as rheumatism and pile. As a rich source of calcium, figs had a main use for preserving bone health. Two other major uses of figs were for the health of the respiratory system, mainly the heart, as well as a powerful facilitator for sleep. Figs were integral in assisting an effective relaxation of the body. And the last but not the least of the dietary elements was water. Water in traditional Arab and Muslim habits had certain benefits on top of its necessity for human survival. Heightened brain function came with ample hydration. Reduction of kidney maladies was another benefit to the timely and ample consumption of water. Water in Islam also had certain methods for its consumption, as in never to be drank at the conclusion of a meal, only at its beginnings or within its midst. Water was also never meant to be drank in one breath, but with a minimum of two to three. The daily physical and mental wellness practices in Islam are based foundationally in two of the five pillars of the faith prayer and fasting. Before prayer, Muslims must perform ablution, which is, in its own right, a hygiene-based ritual that cleanses the bodies over and over again within a single day. And when prayer commences, the movement and prostrations of each prayer cycle provide bodily movement and mobility, promoting skeletal flow as well as muscular flexibility. The method of prayer is also fairly comparable to meditation, and hence completing a prayer can leave a believer in a state of physical, mental and spiritual euphoria. The second pillar of Islam that is extremely therapeutic is the fasting of not only Ramadan, but in following the example of the Prophet, the fasting of another 80 days a year. Fasting brings great mental and physical discipline and achieves many benefits of heightened focus, promotes weight loss, and the strengthening of the immune system. Daily dhikr or recitations, another meditation-like process, 
is a powerful tool to focus the mind on a repetitious task, while at the same time releasing the mind from the turmoil and challenges of life. De-stressing is a major outcome from the use of dhikr and promotes a healthy psyche. If you want to learn more about how Islam overall encourages wellness within its practices and rituals, please check out the link above to one of my previous videos that lays out the various elements within the religion. To understand the use of spiritual healing in the Islamic world, we have to start with a single hadith, a statement made by the Prophet. There is no disease that God has created except that which He has also created its cure. But one must also clarify that such a cure is multifaceted. Traditional and or conventional medicine might have a role to play, but ultimately a distinction has to be made that the final cure comes from Allah alone. The physicians, their actions and prescriptions only make attempts that could succeed or fail based on the will of God. And with that understanding, can we then relay the various factors that contribute to the spiritual healings of traditional Islamic medicine? One of the main aspects of spiritual healing is the use of ailment prayers and supplications. Now these can be performed by either one unto oneself or by others unto you, to attract divine attention in the hope that Allah might instruct his angels to deliver healing. O Allah, Lord of mankind, remove our suffering. Heal us as you are a Shafi, the healer, and none can heal but you, a healing that leaves behind no ailment. And I guess that supplication is what my grandmother had recited unto me. Another form of utilizing prayer and supplication is to recite over food, drink, and medicine that is about to be taken by those who are injured, in pain or suffering, from a certain disease, a type of blessing that further encourages the potential intervention of the divine. An indirect form of spiritual healing comes in the form of charity to an ill person. In that way and in the same way in which attention is brought to the divine by prayers and supplication, charity can achieve the similar results by attracting the attention of Allah as a response to the selfless act of the charitable and in the healing of their suffering. And with all these various forms of therapies came the confirmation by the Prophet Muhammad of many of these ancient systems, thereby providing assurances that these dietary actions or therapeutic practices were indeed beneficial, and at the very least, not harmful in any way. Elevation of traditional medicines from the levels of habit and folklore to that of prophetic acceptance created a major uptick in the application of such practices. All cultures who have always had a traditional and folk approach to medicine, have maintained this connection, even when advancements in medicine accelerated at an unbelievable pace. For many, such traditional approaches to the handling and healing of illness and disease can appear to be quite primitive and archaic. But I don't believe we should belittle its impact on the psyche of those who are ailing or those around them, be their malady extreme or not. The power of its familiarity and it being from the natural world the power of faith as well as of hope is infinite, not necessarily in always achieving the total success and perfect health of any individual, but by raising their state of being and spirit. That alone is worth the effort.